Okay, good evening. It's Wednesday, February 7th, and I'll call the special meeting of the Groton Board of Education to order. And it is 6.05 p.m. So we will go to Chapter 5 in so the budget. Chapter 5, we have a big night tonight. We have... Um, information about our central office specifically um, some of the departments um, that we haven't talked about yet which include business and the superintendent's office um, we also will be um, looking at the town obligations in the budget um, you know which really are pensions OPEB workmen's um, comp I think and um, a few other things and then we will look at the health insurance we've laid it out a couple different ways for the board because I want the board's help and support in figuring out what we're going to do for next year regarding health insurance um, so I think we'll start with um, the central office overview is there a way we can make that a little bigger so we can zoom in everybody should have that in front of them oh, I hope you can hear me better now, Susan, Mark. Susan, did we get that in our packet? No, this was finished today. I Unfortunately, we've had some people out sick, and so we were able to put it together and finalize it today. But you will get it. All right. And what about the other pages that you're talking about? What pages are you going to refer to? So I'm going to start with the overview from the central office. Mm -hmm. We'll be looking at some of the function codes in the back of the book related to the business office and the superintendent's budget. So I'll guide you through that. Now that it's paginated, Beverly, it should be much better for us. And then we're uh, going to, okay. and I, so when we get there, I'll, I'll absolutely tell you what page to go to. Um, and okay. then um, we do have um, a, a simple sheet on the town obligations. And then we have a presentation regarding the health insurance um, that's also hot off the press, and you will get that um, digitally. It probably as soon as tonight, I can probably get it to you with Lori's help. So, um. all right. So, if we look at central office, a lot of people wonder, um, you know, what goes on in central office, and we really call it the hub of the district. I call it sometimes the heart and the hub of the district because this is the place where a lot of work happens in order to support our schools and our programs. This is really a place where there's a lot of action and um, support for getting the teaching and learning accomplished, um, the finances accomplished, the human resources. So if we look at the different departments, um, if we scroll down a little bit, what we've tried to do is tell you some of the operational activities that occur in each department and also show you the staff that supports that. So for instance, in, in administrative offices, which really are room four and five, um, the superintendent's office and also the assistant superintendent's office, this is an area where our curriculum development and instructional planning um, rest. You know, certainly we involve the schools, the teachers, the principals, but this is where a lot of the planning happens and the coordination, the professional development. Um, even though, like I said, we have different committees that really the boots on the ground assist us, like Groton Teaching and Learning with the professional development planning, but the work comes out of the assistant superintendent's office. We have one superintendent, one assistant superintendent, and we have really, um, two to three administrative assistants. One of them is actually connected, one of the um, support people, and I, that goes down further, is with the teaching and learning office. The point three, I think, is for Joan with her board work. Um, so, and, and so the board work is also, you know, I really consider my job, my role, is leading the district, you know, as your CEO, but also, <laughs> supporting board members and supporting you with answering questions, with communications, and that kind of thing. So um, if we scroll down a little bit more, we see the building and grounds, and Sam talked to you about that this week, the facilities and the buildings, the maintenance and custodial services. Um, you know, there's one director, there's a maintenance supervisor, a custodial supervisor, and then one administrative assistant who work out of this building. 
we also have um, the business and finance office, which does budgeting, finance, purchase services, payroll, benefits, insurance, federal and state reporting. I think each of our office has federal and state reporting, so we all get to share the load on that. I didn't put it under everybody's, but we all are responsible for a lot of reporting back to the state. Um, and then I put interdistrict magnets under business because there is a lot of um, record keeping as far as the students who really are Groton students who go to learn schools, they go to Grosso, they go to um, Ledger, they might even go to the Marine, you know, Marine Sciences, a learn school, or New London schools. And in the past, we've really foot the whole bill. We've, you know, we've paid about, I think, five to eight thousand dollars per child and then there's special ed costs that go with that so that's really taken care of in the business office next year there's a new um, legislation that at first was saying it was going to be a hundred percent paid but now we're hearing we can count on maybe 58 percent so we're not really sure with this legislation and it's budget season so we would have liked to know before we set the budget but um, you know we'll have to wait and see I guess so we have one business manager and six accounting assistants in that office. Human resources um, with Lori Lapine, you know, as the director. There's recruitment, hiring, retention of all staff. There's definitely um, looking for um, a talent pool of teachers that mirror our community so kids see themselves. And we've really worked hard with some of those initiatives. Um, but it's really important, not just recruiting and hiring, but also retaining our staff. And we have a pretty good record of retaining staff until they retire. We've got a really good record of doing that, so that's good. And then the staff, um, you know, of course there's the director, there's also an HR coordinator, and there's two and a half assistants. And then registration, you know, that's that front. We have the welcome reception area, and we've got a registrar. And all registration is handled here at central office. The schools help support that process, especially if kids come mid-year, but it's really done as a, a centralized process, which I think keeps, helps to keep things straight. Um, special education, you've heard from Denise Doolittle. So some of these will seem repetitive because she had her own page and you might see other pages, but I just thought a lot of people will ask questions like who's here at central office, right? Um, and then you have your special ed services and outplacements. You have early childhood programs that come underneath the special education. We have the Transition Academy, which is here. And if you ever wanted to do a walkthrough, that's a wonderful place to go and, and see the kids in action. And we also have an alternative ed program, an APEX program. And whether a child has been expelled or needs a smaller learning environment, they often come here and get, you know, get the attention and the, the work that they need um, to do because by law, now expelled children have to get four hours of instruction. So it used to be when you were expelled, you had like a year off, but that no longer. Legislation won't allow that. Kids need to be educated. So, um, and the, the staff in special ed was the one director and there's three supervisors. You met the BCBA, there's one of those. And then there's assistants that, administrative assistants in that department, three of them. Teaching and learning, which is the room right next to Phil's, but he's kind of in both rooms at all times. Um, and so am I. Um, there's our grants and research submission and coordination that happens. There's student information systems, um, management and reporting. There's intra-district magnet programs and lotteries that are taking place um, under their, you know, leadership and work. Communications and marketing and family and student engagement. And the staff is one data manager, one student data um, specialist, and that specialist is someone who does power school. We've always had a power school administrator, and that's what that person does. And then there's a communication specialist and one administrative assistant, which really is um, a woman who helps support Phil. We have you know a couple people, and then she also does the teaching and learning. So she wears a couple hats. With technology, Clint kind of reviewed that, foundational and systems technology, instructional technology, video production and photography is all underneath him. And there's one director, there's a senior system admin, there's a system admin, there's a network admin, there's technology, administrative assistants, they're out, um, no, that's, a, that's an assistant, so that's someone clerical, 0.5. 
and she's gone from one full time to a point five this year. Um, and then there's video technicians, and we know who they are. They're always behind the scenes helping us out in these situations. <laughs> and then transportation, that's another hat that um, Sam Kilpatrick wears with leading that transportation team here, coordinating with STA. He's the first one. If there's any problems with buses, that usually is in the know. <laughs> we both are usually in the know. Um, so, and he also does the food services. And I think if we go down, there was a little area that talks about some other components. Was there one that talks about food services? And so that, while this, yeah, while this is, um, as comprehensive as we could make it, there probably are things I've forgotten about, but there's a lot that happens here. Central office departments and staff work collabor co collaboratively. Um, we work with the whole district. We're here to support the staff, the students, the families, our schools. And um, there's also these additional services that we talk about, um, including enrichment, extracurriculars, food services, nursing and school, based health centers, mentoring programs, and treehouse childcare. So um, a lot goes on in this little old school that I think used to be originally a Northeast, it wasn't the academy, Northeast but Elementary. Northeast Elementary School. It's why Northeast Academy is Northeast Academy, because this was Northeast School. Right. She right. named it Freeman Hathaway, but okay. Right. <laughs> so we can take that down. And to kind of the backup system, if we look at the function codes, if you go to 581 and that is on page well 581 and 582 that actually has the board of education you actually have a function You're, you've got your own function and this is where we have our CABE dues um, when you are invited to your orientation and the annual CABE conference that's where conference fees are for you there's even a national organization that uh, we. What page are you um, going to? I'm sorry. Uh, what five dash five dash eight one and five dash eight two, and um, I'm not seeing the rest of the board. I'm only seeing this room, but I did just see a notification that Bev has a question. Okay. So sorry. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Thank you. We just we just got you on the screen. All right, okay. Beverly. I'm slowing uh, down I so you can ask your question. Shoot. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, on your previous page, when you did technology, Susan? Yes. You had one person, uh, I don't know. What, can you go back? Uh, one yep, person we... for network administration and two for system administration. Did, do you have that on that page that you just showed us? We did. You want us to put it back up again? No, no, I'm good. I okay. don't need to see All right. it again. Why don't you it up there? All right. I got Dr. Kennedy in the room, too. So if I can't answer the question, he will. Now, now what page are you on now? My book fell. I'm sorry. That's all right. So did you have any questions more about the technology staffing? We have the one tech director. We have a senior admin administrator. Then we have a systems administrator and a network administrator. They all work together, especially in light of the things that we've had to deal with in the past five days, five days but who's counting? Um, and they work together beautifully well, but they all have a role to play, but they also coordinate too. And then we have one half-time clerical person. Did you have any more questions about that, Beverly? No, I'm almost said thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you. So when we go to um, some of these central office responsibilities, if you go to your function code pages 581 and 582, that's the board's um, placeholder. And like I said, that the, the biggest thing here is our CABE membership, um, dues and fees, and I think there was, um, you know, certainly there's some travel and professional services in here for you. Um, general supplies. And um, so that really is for our board members and the work that you do. Anybody have any questions about that? 
So the next thing, I, oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so I'll recognize Adrian, and then I see Ian's hand is up, and I saw Andrea. So Adrian. All right, my question is um, on the dues and fees, is that, um, is CAPS included in that as well, or is that somewhere else? No, that is CAPS. CAPS? No, Kate, paid? no. All right, no. so CAPS is somewhere else in the That's budget? That's probably right. under mine. Right. All right. That's in superintendent. superintendent. Yeah, yeah. All right. That was... Um, that was my question. Yep. Okay. And Ian? Uh, yeah, so so the dues in 810, the account 810, are, that's Cape? Dues? That's Cape. Animal? That's Cape, yep. And okay. NSBA, right? Yeah, and then also the... Um, the National Organization, I believe. Right. The National right. School Board Association. Right. right. SBA is School Board Association. That's right. NBSA, yep. National Boards N of Education. NBSA. Yep. <clears throat> Anything else in that line item? I think that's it, no. Dave. No, right. That's it. And professional services I see you got is zero budget for this year? Is that <clears throat> Is that, uh, is that uh, like a, a usual thing, or is that is this an off year for some reason? Well, did that have to do with what has actually been spent in the past, and we reset it, oh. Dave? Ian, Ian, this Dave. Hey, it was uh, it was zero this year as well. It was some money, I guess it was two plus years ago. I'm not quite sure what that was for. So there wasn't anything spent this year, so we just budgeted zero for next year. Okay, thank you. Um, and travel for board members. Uh, what exactly would that entail? Well, let's say, I mean, we're fortunate that the Big Cape Conference is right here in Mystic, so there's not much travel. But if you were to travel somewhere, let's say you had to go to Hartford um, to participate in a CAPE conference or you wanted to take, you know, sometimes there's webinars that you can take so you can do it right from home, but sometimes there's other workshops that you may want to go to. Um, there might be some legislation work up in Hartford that you want to attend. So you can fill and get in mileage. So that's where that money would come from. Okay. Um, so what happens if that amount is not expended? Or then say we like, could reduce our you know, budget by $4,200. Say again? Then we could reduce our budget by $4,200. And in my experience, nobody's, I personally don't yeah, know I, of anyone since 2015 who's put in. I, I've been to conferences and I've never even submitted. I'm not aware that anybody ever has. We can, we can do a little history so. check on that, couldn't we, Dave? <clears throat> to see if that's ever been utilized. I used it when I went Certainly. to Certainly. When I went to Washington. Okay, so I'm years sorry. ago when there was a Washington trip, yes. you might have utilized but, it. But I think any large trip has to be approved by the board. Yes. Just because it's here, budgeted, doesn't mean that it will be used. The board would have to approve if we were going to go off to a conference and decide if that really was a priority mm -hmm. to spend our money. Yeah, because years ago we used to go to the National School Board Conference. And um, I, that money used to be coming out of the board's budget. But now I see nobody goes to the National School Board um, Association conferences. So I don't even know why we join if we don't go to their conference. Their conference is excellent, but I guess nobody goes anymore. I do know that's there was where that a money would come out of. In my tenure, I think um, Rita did go yep. one year. She went um, all, all the time. Well, so I did know there was one board member that used to attend. Yeah, but Vita went a couple of times, but she said Lauren paid for her. Right. Oh, that could have been true. Yep, I, I kind of remember that too, Beverly. Um, so uh, actually that brings up a good question. Um, so the National School Board Association and CABE, I guess, you know, what's the overlap and what's the separation? What's the Venn diagram breakdown of how these two organizations exist and how we lean on them or and how they support us? I would say CABE is almost an essential ingredient when it comes to policy, when it comes to getting information, um, the resources, the free webinars that we get, 
at all times. I try to send them out to the board when I, you know, when we get them through. So we'll make intentional ways for you to get that. Those are all within this cost. They send out all the legislation for us to pay attention to. Um, so it's really, I think, an essential ingredient for the operations of the district and for the board. Um, and I can't speak to the national organization as well. I haven't really participated in, in much of that. Um, but can we get a, a cost on what that membership is and what we're getting? I mean, obviously there are things they do other than, than this big conference. Um, and then we can decide whether it's right. something we really we want to submit our. Yep. I would be happy to do um, that. Okay. So just to follow up on that question then, um, what is the partition be of, between the two? We have the one lump number there of you know, 22,604 for this coming year. What part of that is CAVE and what part of that is NSBA? Is that something you can answer right now, Dave, or we do we have to look it up? It's, it's actually in my office. I just okay. haven't been in this week, so I can get that for you quickly. Yeah. Um, we, we'll get that. Okay, so, you know, I did, I did send the questions over a week ago, and one of the questions I sent was asking for sort of like a, a breakout of, of, that's the sort of breakout I'm looking for when I'm talking about uh, an expandable budget. I would like to have the ability to know what's inside these line items, you know, one step or two steps down. Um, you know, having dues, that's great to know, okay, that's a very, but that's a very broad term. There's no specificity there. Um, so moving forward, uh, you know, that's definitely something I'd like to try to work on to see if we can, we can do to gain more understanding at times like this. Thank you. Okay. Andrea. My question was answered. Okay. Uh, I also see uh, Matthew has his hand raised. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I'm going back in my mind to the uh, central office staffing uh, discussion or presentation. And I was just curious uh, how many, what staffing reductions or additions have come about between the last year and the proposed year? There are um, no additions to my knowledge and I think we have uh, at least a half reduction. Um, yeah, that's what I know. Thank you. Uh, Beverly? Where would that half reduction be, Susan? That was the clerical staff member. The half reduction was the clerical staff member that's in the technology department. Okay. And um, one other thing. NSBA, they don't send out a magazine anymore. They used to have a magazine they sent out, I don't know, maybe quarterly or monthly. I can check on we that. Get any information from NSBA, like we get from Kate. I think that sometimes they'll send e emails. I'll ask Joyce to pay attention to see if we get an email. I don't know if they have it now, the, the magazine you're referring to digitally. So I will find out for you so that at least if we have the membership, you guys can use it. Yeah. Well, we should know, like, what are we getting for our membership? I guess right. that's a key question. I will ask that question. All right, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I guess we can move on. Okay. So we turn the page to the superintendent's office, <clears throat> which is 583 and 584. <clears throat> and you see also included are the salaries with the positions that I've just outlined. Um, you, you see things like workman's comp and social security and retirement. Um, and those retirements, are those past retirements, Lori? So I can, I can, I can help oh, you with that. Okay, so yep. The, the, Two, the, one, the three. pension obligation that we have on behalf of the district, it's split in the superintendent's code and the, um, the business office code. So it's for so all is, of the 
all the obligations that we have for retirees is here That's correct. and in yep. the business office. Okay. Um, Susan, then, if I can make two more notes on this yep, one. Yep, yep. Um, down the bottom under line 628, excuse me, you'll see $20,000. So that um, is a placeholder for potential unfunded lunch balances next year. If you recall, we might hit sort of 80,000 this year. So it's just some sort of placeholder potentially to okay. help us next year. Even In though addition, we're thinking this year might be 80,000. That's correct, yeah. I, so. This year seems like a, a very high number, but I wanted to have something to help for next year. Okay. And then also, just one last thing, on 334 legal services, that's sort of the district-wide legal service cost. Okay. That's the budget for the entire district. Okay. Are there other things, too, um, that would be related to the whole district? Like I see repair of equipment, that's probably... Um, our Xerox machines and things like that, right? It's a portion of, you know, we split some yeah. of those out. Okay. We allocate some of those. And postage, while we really do so much electronically, there's still the need to send some things out. Like we, we actually have some of the SBAC scores that go out to families and that is sent in the mail. So um, whether it's sent by the school or whether it's sent by the district. Um, and there's a nominal fee for advertising um, and some printing cost. Tra there is some travel for administration. Um, I tend to use more of my travel through grants, like there's maybe one thing I do a year that is related to DODIA, where we get all of our grants and that's paid for through the grant. Um, and then there's a small administrative um, supplies for our offices here. So um, one of the things I do, I've asked each department to do is, this is just forward thinking, is to go through each of their budgets because we will be giving you kind of a T-chart chart that shows you things that we're gonna be taking away from the budget. So just know that that work is happening um, to kind of reduce it in any way that we can. Um, and then be able to present that to the board as well. I see Ian has his hand raised. Ian. Uh, thank you. Um, just a quick call up to the superintendent. What, what was that you just said about? So I've asked each of my directors to pay attention to each of their budgets and to see what we can do to reduce our budgets, to streamline. For instance, I probably will take off some of that travel cost because I usually do my travel through grants. So there are things that we're gonna be really, um, you know, paying close attention to so that you'll see the things that we're able to take away from this budget to make some cost savings and efficiencies. When will we see that? So that's, that's the work we were hoping to do this week, but we've had a couple people ill, so we're gonna be trying to get it out to you between this week and next week. Okay. Um, with the travel, that travel line, we have travel for administration and then travel for workshops and conventions. Travel for administration, that would be just general travel around the district to like uh, visit facilities and consult with uh, staff, inspect areas, that sort of thing? Yeah, it could be trips to, you know, Hartford trips, other trips too. So there, that would be it. Or the travel for workshops and conventions would be that other travel that would be for, for a convention. Um, okay, so do we have, how many conventions are scheduled for the coming year? Well, I just said, I just usually take one. It's usually related to DODIA and it usually gets paid for through the grant. So that's okay. something that I'll be so looking at as a reduction. That's an area that could be cut? Right. All right. And what did you want to say something, Dave? I didn't. I, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I thought Ian was finished. My apologies. No worries. Um, so line item six two eight. Um, the food supplies. Moving forward, I, I know there's a bill uh, that's going through the legislature now that's looking at uh, doing 
um, something with free lunch uh, for all. Right, I saw that and too. And so on the chance that that actually passes uh, in a, in a, at a point where like all food is covered for all the students, what happens to these line items that are all having to do with food supplies? Well, I think that that will be able to be a potential cost efficiency. The problem with that is I've heard that this legislation is from now till the end of the year, and I don't know that they're talking about it into the following year. So, so it that's, does not align with the school year? Well, that's to be determined, Ian. It's really a little confusing. Even with the magnet cost reduction, we thought the state was going to pay full price for the magnet tuitions, but now we're hearing it's more like 58% according to my legislators. So they'll make these legislations, they'll say they're paying for something and then minds get changed and their budget is going through and then they'll say partial. So we don't want to leave ourselves too stranded. We've got to be careful about that, you know. But it, it was good news for me to hear that. I would love for that to happen, but I'm just not sure what the time frame is for that legislation yet. All right, thank you. Can I make one note, please? Sure. Sure. I just I just thought for the group, just um, as you look at superintendent's office, just keep in mind this this also includes human resources. So it includes like all of our recruiting activities, job days, those type of things. That's right. It's not just the superintendent's work. Okay. Any other questions on this function? No, I think we can move to the next one, which is the business office. So we just flipped the page, 585 and 586. And um, I can let you speak to that since this is your office, Dave. We have the one administrator. We have yep. the, the six clerical administrators and a temporary. I don't know if we've. No, I, can, I got yep. it. I can take okay. it. So it's it's same staff, um, just an absolute wonderful staff as I've grown on board with them and, and helped me out. Um, so the, the temp work, I just wanted to kind of address this primarily to Ian. So um, there's two different lines that you'll see increases here. One is around temp, and then there's one in professional services. The temp line is my placeholder. Um, anticipating some temp help if we get the chance to, to migrate into a more sophisticated budgeting system. Just having done this a few times, we're going to need some help with data transfers, reconciliations, tie-outs, those type of things. So it's it's minimum wage, and I don't have my sheet, but it's a certain number of hours that I just estimated. So that, that's just an estimate um, in case we get the opportunity to, to translate into or transfer it to another system. The and professional fees really are three things for me. <laughs> One is, <laughs> excuse me, it's our, our audit fees, mm -hmm. um, our bank fees, and then we also have a budget module within our e-finance program that we pay for today that um, we just haven't used. And the reason all that is going up is if you look at uh, two years ago and then this year, we, we didn't have any increase budgeted for this year. So I'm going to be over budget. Our audit fees are higher than what, what we had budgeted. Bank fees are a little bit up. Um, so just everything's increasing. So this is really sort of a two-year catch-up as you look at it. Um, in, in terms of, I just want to give a quick update because Ian's asked this question a couple times. In terms of sort of a budget module, so there's two that I've been looking at, and I'll keep it really brief. One is already within our e-finance system. Um, I'm waiting to get a tutorial on that. The second one, Power School, just actually purchased um, a pretty high-end budgeting platform um, maybe a week or so ago. One that I've used and implemented that's almost gives you the capabilities that everyone's been talking about. So I don't know if that acquisition is completely baked yet, but I thought I'd reach out to them and see if I can get a, a quote on what their services would look like for us. Thank you for that. And I think your dues are with CASBO, which is your organization. <laughs> That's all that is, yep. Yeah. Any questions around the business? 
So if we do upgrade to this new um, system that you've used previously, um, obviously we, we don't have any idea um, whether they're going to change say, the – yeah, I mean I, – I don't, and I, you know, I, to be honest, I, I just didn't want to pad the budget with just a, a guess right now. I just don't have any good intel on it, so I thought – Right. You know, I, I knew I, I knew specifically I'd need some quick data help, but I don't know exactly what the platform itself would look like in terms of cost yet. We are doing a thorough job, though, doing an audit on our software, both, um, you know, informational, functional, and instructional. And so we, I'm really, I'm really seeing this as a top priority for our budgeting process and for our accounting so we can give you all those things that you're looking for in a clearer view rather than on an Excel spreadsheet because that's really a complicated way to do it. And so I'm hoping that we'll find some efficiencies with this audit, that we can take things away that aren't being used right or don't need to be, they're not efficient, they're not necessarily the best that we could have and by doing that maybe open up the possibility to afford what Dave and what I'm looking for that's going to be better usage and better more efficient process for this work so Jen um, in regards to um, increases in compensation on average it appears that's roughly three percent but there is like an anomaly in one of the line items and I just wanted to understand if that was contractual or um yep the okay. cut the directors the team all have contractual um and it's it's been averaging like a two percent but there are some times where there's an overtime or there's a um in the contract that they can buy some of the vacation time back if it's hard to get vacation time in this, but just a, a minimal amount. So that's all in their contract. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because, yep, that's yep. fine. Uh, next, I'll recognize Ian. Thank you. Um, in regards to the uh, audit that uh, the superintendent just spoke of, uh, when do we expect that to be completed and submitted to the board for review so that was in process and was ready for delivery and then we had um, a little glitch with our systems that has taken really a lot of time of our direct tech director so um, I'm expecting to probably meet with them before the end of the week he says tomorrow <laughs> so they've got it ready for me I just have to review it and make some decisions right, so I in a few weeks, we might be able to get a look at it. Well, I'm no, I'm uh, hoping to review it with them tomorrow. So if I can get it out for the weekend, I'll get it out for you. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. And so this is that study. That's that of study. Of what we're actually using. Right. Make sure we don't have any licenses we're paying for that no one's actually taking advantage of. Right. Or maybe other systems. Or, that... or taking advantage of in a very limited way, or maybe yeah. they're obsolete at this point. Okay. I mean, even instructionally, we're making so many shifts that it might be something that we were using and we don't need to be using anymore. So there's a lot of factors. And we did a survey to our teachers because they matter. So our teachers giving us feedback on these different tools that we've been using. I want to know their thoughts and how that's helping them with planning of instruction. So, you know, I'm not going to do it blindfold and just look at usage. I really need to understand from the staff's point of view on what they see as viable and useful and, you know. So a lot of thought goes into this. Okay. Dean. Jay, thanks. So uh, this is a, relates to this section, Dave, and also all the other sections. I have with me in my hot little hands, um, the board's budget, the fiscal year ending 24 board budget. So it has the 23-24 budget figure in it. But when I look at the same column in this one, the figures differ. And I think the reason why there's a discrepancy, and correct me if I'm wrong, is because 
in the documents that we have for the proposed fiscal year ending 25 budget that has a column for the FYE 24 budget, you've adjusted those numbers to not include the number that we don't know yet or didn't know at the time of printing, which was the health insurance. Is that why there'd be a discrepancy between these two? Yes. Okay, but there's no other reason why there would be a discrepancy. Should, there shouldn't be, no. Okay. All no, right. and, th and that's gonna be another piece when the board helps us to decide what that number looks like for health insurance. Right. When we put it back in, we've got to roll out the systems again. So it might be another take out some pages and put in the fresh pages with the new numbers yeah. that include health. Because there, there, there are a lot, there are a lot of numbers, and I get it. I've worked yeah. with lots of numbers myself, and I'm looking, just thinking, wait a minute, how come this number doesn't align with that number? This number ought to be like that number. And I think it's the health insurance yeah, yeah. that you've allocated through yeah, the different functions, but stripped out of the present draft. For That's now. exactly what I was going to say. It's, it's okay. not just one number, right? Because it's allocated throughout the entire place. And I wanted to make sure, excuse me, you had apples to apples, right? Not in one year and not in the other year as well. Okay, got it. Thank you. If we don't have any more questions, we can move to the town obligations. I don't know. Do you see anybody else who has any questions? No, I'm not seeing anything. So I know Lori's going to put this up. Um, and I can have Dave explain. These are um, budget expenditures that are received from the town that we need to pay yeah, these as are a board. Four items that they, they pass right. Us. So the first one, I'll just go line by line because there's only four. There. Those are yep. the two SROs, one at GMS and one at Fitch. Um, so. In 24 is 139,000. It's 144. At least that's what they have given me thus far. So that's an increase of $4,800. The retirement pension allocation. This is this is the number we just talked about. That split between the business and the superintendent's office. It was 737,000 this year. Um, I did talk to D. As a matter of fact, she left me a message. I haven't had a chance to get back to her, but. Um, I should have that number. If not tomorrow, I should probably have that by Friday, the new number. But that, that's an actuarial calculation. Um, nothing we can really do with that, but I wouldn't expect that to change dramatically. So can I ask you this question under, I know you've explained this, but I just want to make sure I've got it right. FY25 budget, that 737.5 number, which is identical to FY24, that's kind of a placeholder. We don't know what that new number is yet. We don't, we don't know, know what that, that new number, number is, but I have the 737-500 in our budget now. Okay. So if there's any change, we'll just have to reconcile to the change. I want okay. to make sure we had at least the, the baseline. At least what we had our, last year. Ongoing. Good. All right. Yeah, exactly. Um, same, same thing. Excuse me. Same thing with workers' compensation. Um, 352. Uh, I should have that update as well. I mean, she's committed to give me those. Okay. And then OPEB, which is the you know, post-retirement contributions we make for, re for uh, retirement benefits. Um, that was about a million four this year. That one million six is the, the actual determined number for next year. But there is um, contemplation that it, legally we might be able to do a one four number instead of a one six. We just have to get confirmation on that. Is that correct? Um, yeah, so if I can just explain that to the board real quick. So the, the million <coughs> six is, uh, that's an actuarial determined number based on assets and liabilities and expected payouts over time. Um, the million four that the superintendent just referenced is, is really just the expected payout, claim payouts that we would have next year. So that, that's the difference there. So what we don't know is, you know, usually you follow what's called the ADC, which is the actuarial determined number. And what we have to get some clarity on is, can we just pay up to the amount of expected claims next year? So Dave, yes. on that note, could we apply the same analysis to the FY24 budget? Do we know the exact payout? Versus the actuary. I, about 100, I think it's about $160,000 less than what you what you see on that page there. Okay. So but that would be it's helpful. Not, it's, not huge, it's not a huge difference because we're not, um, and I won't, I won't make this complicated, but we're not really funded that heavily, right? We're about 
8% funded, meaning our total assets are about 8% of what the total liability is. So you don't really see that much of a difference between the actuarial determined number and what the, the typical payouts are. Okay. Yeah, I'd be very interested to know what the, the actual amount would be for fiscal 24. That's a good question. We can ask that question. The other thing I don't see here, and I, I'm loath to bring it up, is the town's expected contribution for the liability, the um, property liability that uh, the town manager had intimated he wanted to um, to raise our percentage on. Have we heard anything on that? Um, yeah, so Jay, it, it's not here, um, not, not to draw straws really, it's because that's it's sort of a shared policy. These were just items that they passed directly to us, so I was just trying to keep it separately. Um, I, I do have a step, well, we've heard, he's told us, so that's not, okay. it's not a debatable item at this point. He's told us. I do have a schedule. Um, I can certainly send that to you tomorrow. That's no problem. I did sort of the calculation of what that split would look like going forward, so I can send that to you as well if you like. Well, I do remember that that's his expectation, but I, I, I thought that at the time we were waiting for that quote along with the health insurance. So is that something we could put on that FAQ so that everybody can see yep. it tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. We can do That'll that. Great. Thank you. Dean. Thanks. Um, the OPEB contribution, um, I'm probably just missing it. Where would that be in the budget? Yeah, so Dean, it, it actually gets, um, because it's re really retired medical benefits, it's in with our health insurance number. Oh, I'm going to show it to you. Yeah, we're going to show that to you. Okay, yeah. all right. I, I mean, I knew that that was part of it, but I didn't know that it was all of it. Yeah. Okay. If we don't have any other, oh, do you have a question? No. I just don't want to miss you over here. <laughs> um, the... I think we're moving along to the health insurance, and we have a presentation um, and even some pictures that might explain to some board members what corridor looks like and that kind of thing that Ken had helped us with understanding a little better back in the day. So. Uh, really, I got just a few uh, before we get into that. Is there a corresponding um, object code we should be following along on or anything in our packets? Um, so Ian, this is yeah, I can help you with that. Um, so Ian, this is the one we uh, put zero in because we were waiting on the renewal that we just got last week. So this is this is what Dean was just mentioning where we, so, we don't really have a placeholder in there yet for this one. So what it, when when you look at your function code though, Ian, we're going to fill this up once the board helps us to decide what is that number going to look like because I'm you know this is something I really need your help on, and. With, that's on page 591 and 592, but as um, Dave just said, we kind of left that first part blank. Um, we have not filled that in yet, but we will. But this presentation is going to hopefully show you um, what we've learned. Um, you know, we did have that specialized meeting. I think Lori and um, Dave worked with the town and then our insurance providers to kind of get clarity around what's been our trends and what they're looking for in increases. So that's what this presentation is all about. And that meeting took place at the very end of January. That's why we're just kind of getting to this now. Thank you. I, I can take this if we could flip to the next page, please. So I, I thought I would just ground you quickly on, excuse me, our historical health care costs. So the graph on the, on the left there, the blue is what our actual costs have been since 2015. Orange is really what the insurance company has told us before the renewal what our expected costs were going to be. So every year we've come in underneath what their expected costs were. And, and, I, and I would expect that, you know, they're gonna be conservative in their pricing, except for this year. So the little box here just tells us, you know, thus far, this is the only year that we're running above their expected cost. Um, so what I've done is 
Just off to the right, just give me a sort of a numerical reference. Can we maybe make that to... bigger, Lori, now that he's looking to the right? Or no? Okay. Because I wanted you I wanted to get a chance. We do have it in front see, of you. See. I just wanted to make sure you had a chance to see year over year numerically how we've come in and how close we've been or over what their expected cost will be. And on the bottom, you know, the yellow highlighted areas, um, I was really just giving you a sort of goalpost, right? So the first one was really, if I took a nine year average and excluded our most current year, because we're only halfway through, you know, we've been averaging about a million 161 favorable each year, or about 91% of their expected cost. And at the top, if you just take our two most recent years, assuming 24 develops the way we think it's going to, um, you know, we're running a little bit above. We're running about 101%. So I just wanted to give you the goalpost there because if you look year over year, you know, you always have a year here or there that's an outlier, but generally we've been in that goalpost over the last nine years or so. So I wanted to give you sort of a 20, fiscal year 24 update. Um, the first column really is just to orient you and ground you on the original budget for this year. So we went into this year with contributions of 10.2 million and expected costs of about 13.7. So we knew we were going to have a shortfall. We had a a placeholder to utilize about $2.8 million of our reserve to cover that shortfall, um, which would leave, still left us a little bit short, but then we made some budget adjustments on top of that. So we, we kind of really went into this year about a million three, million four short in terms of funding against the ex expected cost that our carrier provided us. So now as we fast forward, um, I'm just going to focus on the box real quick because that's probably the most important thing. You know, our estimated costs are about 14.4 million. <clears throat> and so what I've done is I've taken the first six months of our actual costs that I've been sharing with you at the board meetings, and then I took the final six months of uh, fiscal year 23, thinking that's the most recent activity that we've had, and just added those two together to come up with that 14.4. Um, Spring, spring, is, spring is really tricky. If you look at some historical data, it's our, it's been our highest months. Um, so we're gonna have to really watch this as we've been. But really what that would tell us is, we'd be about, call it three, five, three, six shortfall. And then I highlighted, you know, if we decide to use the reserve to, to kind of get us whole for this year, we'd have to use about that same amount to get us to zero. Um, but importantly, as you start to shift to the right there, I wanted to give you an update on the insurance reserve, which is, again, why I highlighted this one in yellow. So for the board only, I did get some updates from town. For the board only, <coughs> excuse me for one second. Um, you know, our reserve is 5.6 million, call if I just round. The corridor, if you use the self-insured renewal claim projection numbers would be about 3.7 million, which would leave us a reserve balance of 1.9 million. Yeah. The only other note I want to make on 24 is um, right now we've been passing to the town about $450,000 a month to cover our health care cost. Um, that's only going to that's only going to work up to about May, probably the end of May, because depending on what we decide to do with OPEB. But if you look at the bottom there, our healthcare insurance, our Board of Education insurance budget, you know, we expected we had a plan, let's say, of about 1.2 million dollars for OPEB contribution, and the number, the actuarial number, is 1.5. So that almost eats up one month of um, healthcare. Um, transfers that we can make to the town. <clears throat> okay. Um, Dave. <clears throat> yeah. The 1.166, 
um, OPEB contribution. That was what was budgeted. Is that also the minimum required? I don't, I don't know, Jay. I just, I just okay. know that's in the budget. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you the minimum, though. I don't have okay. the packet, but I can, I can okay. get it for you for sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. And just, just for... Um, I don't know if, if we've discussed it with, with this board, but the corridor is a percentage of the entire um, insurance cost. It's supposed to be like a buffer against the, the plan going underwater, right? And that, that's, we, we can't touch that. That's um, the amount that sort of to keep us safe. And then the reserve is theoretically what was over and above the corridor from possibly even from prior periods. Right. Though we're yeah, using it. The corridor, I, I should have put this down here, Jay, but, you know, the corridor really is a, it's a 25% of your next year renewal claim projection. That's sort of your buffer because we are a self-insured plan because as you, as you just said, you know, we don't really have any, any other recourse. We have to have something there to protect us. Though we also do have, uh, backup insurance for catastrophic individual claims if something comes in over a certain amount on individual uh, claims. So there's, there's that as well. And we're also paying a premium on that. That's correct, yeah. Okay. So if we can flip, maybe I can... Give you an update on this year. So, um, just, actually, if you could, hold on just a second, Dave. I think Ian had a question on that page. Sorry. Yeah. No, no I, I, my, my, my question, question can wait to the end of the presentation. The presentation. I thought okay. We were, I thought we were there. So. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll wait to the end. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, this is same type of format. This is maybe a little more data here, but I wanted to give you, um, if you think about the goalpost analogy again, this just sort of goalpost ranges here on how this may play out for next year just given our, our renewal numbers. So the column to the left, you know, where it says 91% funded, I know it's a funky number, but if you remember the, the yellow highlighted numbers on the first slide there, which was, I used the 91% funded, which sort of was the lowest level of the goalpost that we've achieved on average over the last nine years. So I just said, okay, if on average this is where we've been, um, the landing, let's just use that as our, our low end. So just using that, you know, you go through the, you go through the contributions. Um, I've taken the claim pick from Anthem and have taken 91% of that. That's what, that's the $14 million number you'd see. There's the million six that you've seen earlier relative to OPEB. So to get that to zero, we can scroll down just a little bit here. Sorry. Oh, yeah, it's kind of tough, I know. So if, to get it to zero, if you look at our budget on the bottom there, um, you know, our contributions would have to be 9.3 million. It's 11.6 in total because, again, you know, you're going to pay your OPEB separately. We're going to make HSA contributions, and we have just a small amount for life and disability. But really, relative to the health care, our contributions are 9.3 million. And I'm going to show you on the next slide this sort of what that translates into. But if you go to the right column, what I wanted to give you is just, you know, what if we decided that we just wanted to fully fund, take the claim pick that Anthem has provided as sort of a, a true number, what does that start to look like for us? And, and if you follow along, um, the contributions go up because our contributions on the bottom go up, but the claim pick really what they told us again is the most important thing so that 15.4 million is is kind of what they're telling us is the expectation is for next year so it starts to look like a really big number when you add opeb in there because now you're over 17 million which means down the bottom again our contributions have to be 10.7 million dollars just to achieve that fully funded anthem pick number so those, so those are kind, are kind of, of two ranges, ranges for you to, you know, we could pick anything in between, but I wanted to kind of give you the, the typical and then sort of the, the fully funded. So if we can flip. So really what this means is same format you've seen before, but up top is, it, it's probably not the right term anymore, but I'm just keeping it the same. So the proposed 
and what that budget would look like, assuming we have the 91% funded health care insurance number. Um, so that's an additional $5 million over last year, which gets us to 13, 13.5%. And then the bottom, if, if we decided to go after the fully funded model, um, it's another 6.4 million or 15%. So what this assumes, just to kind of ground you a little bit, is um, that there's really no health care reserve above the corridor to utilize that we've utilized in the past for budgeting purposes. Because if you remember the yellow numbers that I showed you earlier, you know, it's possible that we're going to dip into the corridor this year. Um, and certainly exhaust anything above the corridor that we just wouldn't have the ability to carry forward next year. So I'm going to pause at this point. Any questions at this point? Ian. Um, this, may, this is more sort of a, a, a general question. Um, you know, I've observed a number of budget cycles now, <clears throat> and, you know, it always, this, the health insurance always seems to be kind of this, this shifting thing at the, this moment in time. And uh, is it that we don't get the costs from the companies until this time of year in January? Or is there another time so that some of this health, all this discussion that we're having now you know, we could have the, the numbers kind of more settled and that way they could be incorporated into the budget as we look at the budget as a whole. You know, if, if we start looking at the health insurance stuff, say like October, November, um, or is it the way the companies work that they don't have their information out to us in time for us to do anything like that? I can start with that, Ian. Um... You know, historically, you know, you get your renewal. We got our renewal in January, uh, which is it was about five, five and a half months prior to the end of the fiscal year. And the reason that really is, right, because they want to, uh, they take two different data points when they start to think about your rates. One is your prior 24 months and then your most recent experience. So they're trying to gather as much most recent experience as possible. For us, um, Honestly, it plays to our advantage because if you recall, the last two months have really been um, good news for us. So I was kind of pleased that although it might seem like it's late in the game, it's it's really fits within their standard and it actually plays to our advantage in terms of pricing. Um, the one thing I think you had a good point on is, you know, I've been sharing the, the health insurance numbers every month, which has been tricky this year is trying to predict what the year looks like. And if we call, uh, this, this is kind of a weird year that I've seen in, in a long time. You know, we've had ranges from $800,000 a month to a million three a month. And part of that is um, we're in this zone again that this is not typical primary care physician costs that we're seeing. We're seeing swings in our mid-tier claims, which are 50 to 200,000, which become almost impossible to predict because that's a different level of severity than just typical right. utilization. Hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> if, in, in, if somehow we were to kind of play the other scenario out, um, I mean, I mean in your experience, this sort of sequence of events that's happened over the past year, where we've had a, a, a lot of like uh, wild range of claims, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is that a thing that's sustained, or is that a thing that's kind of a, a certain spike and then do things kind of settle out after a while? And like, say, in other districts you're been familiar with. Yeah, if I can, um, if we could go back to page two for a second, I just wanted to illustrate, just as I answer that question, if you didn't mind. So if you look at the, the numerical numbers, what's interesting, and, and Ian, I, I just don't have the background here, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just studying as I go along here. But we've, we've kind of been here before. If you look back at 2015 and 16, we've had some 
you know, fairly high years. I mean, the 13 million for us is a pretty high year. And then we've had some slopes and it seems like we're almost kind of crawling back into that. So it's, um, it's hard for me to tell. I haven't seen a swing like this. You know, when I was in Hartford, as an example, our, our healthcare budget was 80 million. Uh, but we'd fluctuate anywhere, honestly, between 72 and 83, 84. So even though that seems like a lot, but it's on 80 million, eight or nine million is not, you know, it's a 10% swing. Um, so here it's been interesting just given the types of claims and the, the uniqueness in which how quickly they spiked on us. Understood. Thank you. I, <clears throat> um, let me just ask this from a different angle. Um, if the goal was to try to have the health insurance numbers settled out and incorporated into the, the big budget vote prior to these deliberations. Um, I mean, these peaks and valleys over time, like as you noted, it, it kind of just does its thing. And, you know, over any 10 year span or 15 year time, time frame, it's, it's going to kind of just be what it is. So whether we lose a, a couple months of recency versus, you know, trying to take a snapshot at an earlier time. Um, if our goal ultimately is to try to maybe get this number hammered out in the October, November, December time so that when January comes, we have that number in our budget already so we can just kind of you know, move right along. Um, what would have to happen with the, with the insurance companies and with the town? Is it in any way possible for that sort of scenario to come together? It's a two-part question. Yeah, so I'll answer for, well, I don't know if this is the first or the second part, so I'm just gonna answer. So you're not gonna get the insurance company to give you a rate renewal quicker than what they're giving you. That's just part of their practice. So what we could do, as you're thinking out loud about this, is you know, we could take three or four months of claims, almost like I did for my estimate for this year, you know, you've got to kind of rely on your most recent experience. So we could take our actual up to a certain point and then trend that out given our most recent 12 months and say, okay, this is what we think the claim pick is going to be and let's calculate that for the first round of the budget. We can certainly do that. Um, I, I would tell you this, I mean, I just came in at the beginning of this, but I would have been way off this year if I had to pick that. Um, just given, you know, again, the volatility of the claims this year that we've seen month over month. But it, it's, it's a viable, it's another goalpost for you per se in terms of a, a data point you can look at and study for sure. Oh, Jen. Hi. Um, Thank you. So I know we're just looking at dollars and we're looking at costs, right? But have the number of employees increased? Um, and I would believe so because we hired people dur um, for that, our SR. So um, the 11.8 in 2022, 11.7 in 2023, and the estimated of 12.9 in 24, that is like if I'm assuming that we have more staff, that's probably more in line of where our insurance is going to be going forward. Would that be a fair assessment? Jen, it, it, it's, it's actually, actually just the opposite, yeah. believe it or not. So it it's, it's really not employees, it's number of people that enroll in the plan, and, and that number has been Drops. steadily declining, you know, it's, a couple percent each, each year. I don't know the exact yeah. number, but two to three percent each year. Yeah. So okay. at one point I shared with the board a graph that showed, you know, what the average claim cost is per employee and how that has been rising as the um, enrollees have been dropping. Okay, so is it the people who can't get coverage who, so we're, I don't know how I'm gonna say this without sounding sort of crude, but is it the people who are staying who feel that our benefits may be better? And so then we have not a very diverse um, population of insured. 
Yeah, so the, you know, the term for that is adverse selection. And I, yes. I did mention, yep. that, with the, I did mention that with the insurance company. They looked into it and said that's not the case with us. That's not the case? That is not. Okay. And our grant-funded employees are not benefit They're not. Okay. eligible. Is, is that correct? Well, many of them that are there are the tutors, and, and I think it's very cost-prohibitive for those. Yeah, some are, some aren't. Yeah, right. But if they, uh, you know. yeah, I'm just going to recognize Matthew's had his hand up, and then Adrian. Matthew. Thank you, Jay. Hello. I understand every word you're saying individually, and I'm having a hard time putting together a full picture. The easy question is, what was the district share in 2024 in dollars? The district, I'm trying I'm to understand you. Did you hear the question, I Dave? Didn't hear you. The district share in 2024. I'm trying to get a um, So if it's on my slide, if we can slide down. Um, Right there. So Matthew, you see down at the bottom where it says Board of Education Insurance Budget? So the original budget, where you see health and dental contribution, oops, sorry. Down at the bottom, it's 4,967,000 down there. That's, that is our original budgeted contribution for just health insurance. And then the employees, then the employees pay a portion as well. As I understood you a few minutes ago, you said that you see the ninety one and one hundred percent figures. That would be looking at it. Maybe the 2025 budget projection of 9.3 or 10.7 million dollars. I'm trying to get a comparison to what that relates to. Yeah. So if you just stay on this, hold this number in your head. The 4.967 million down the bottom here. That was our budget for this year, just for health care, not including OPEB and HSA and life and disability. So call it five million. If you flip to the next slide, follow the same line down the bottom, health dental. At the 91% funded, it's 9.3 million. At the full funded, it's 10.7 million. So that's at the 10.7 million dollars that would be the interest of increase. I'm sure I'm getting that wrong. It's double the number. No, because uh, remember, Matthew, uh, uh, we don't have a reserve this year for, for next year's budget, that is, to necessarily offset any of these costs that like we've utilized in the past. Right. On top of that, we've got the rate increase just given our, our claim history this year as well. So let me, let me try a different question. The, Initial proposed budget showed an increase of 8.27 percent. The initial proposed budget, if my memory is correct, using either 9.3 or 10.7, what would be the impact on the budget? If we can flip to the there it is right there. So the top one, Matthew, is the 91% funded. It just the bottom. Can't see. It's not your fault if it just simply can't see it. It's not large enough for me to be you on the screen. I'm very sorry. Well, we can talk you through it. So I can, I can tell you. So the 8.2% turns into 13.5% at the 91% funded, and it turns into 15 and change. I don't know exactly. 15% at if we decide to fully fund it. Okay. Okay. 
I don't know what else to say at this moment, but thank you very much for elucidating that figure for me. Okay, thank you. Adrian? Yeah, this, this was just kind of following up on grant-funded positions. Um, so if we have a position, you know, where they give us a certain amount of money to hire an employee and that job would typically come with benefits, then the district is required to, or is responsible to pay those benefits? Is that how that works? Typically, we put in a certain amount for the benefits in the, in, in the grant. Yeah. yeah, typically we do that. To cover the and they're usually the five-year grants. All right. So, so they're not coming out of the <clears throat> operating budget. Right. All right. Uh, one more question, question if I may, Jay. Yes. Um, you've been using, if I understood correctly, two to three percent of the number of people enrolling per year. Would it be fair to characterize that as young people for whom their sense of health and fewer pre-existing conditions plus very high expenses, would that be the people who are not enrolling? No. Or don't we know? No, not necessarily. No. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? So I, I do believe that in my tenure since 2014, I've seen budgets coming in at zero, oftentimes zero, one percent. I think the highest I've seen it was like that 2.97. Um, we've had good history with our health care, but we've also been really recommended, not just from the board's sake, but through the town council and the RTM to really look to the health savings um, account or look to those um, extra benefits above the corridor. So we've dipped into that year after year. And in the, a time of inflation, I just call it the perfect storm that we're facing, that we have these inflationary costs, we've been dipping into our insurance to cover the cost to get us to zero or one percent. And, and now there's, you know, there's just no way around it. I mean, it's just really the perfect storm. Now, will we absolutely go and try to carve out as many things as possible? We're doing scheduling with our, um, with our middle school and high school and, you know, with the goal to have classes of 20 to 24 like I have at the elementary school across the board. There might be some classes that aren't going to run next year like they typically have. So that really is a goal, and with, with the retirements, you know, we really look to that and, and really try to balance our departments between the middle school and high school. Um, so there, there could be some efficiencies, but if I wanted a number that was below a double-digit number, a 9.9, .9, we're talking about cutting $3.2 million to get there. That, that's, that's really, you know, that could be programmatic changes. Um, so, you know, I've had people suggest, well, you could do pay, pay, pay for play. And I, I say, well, we've got kids who might not pay if I have pay per, for play. So it's an equity issue to me. So there's certain things that, you know, I don't know that this board would have, you know, the, the drive to, to take some things away from kids. You know, we really wanted a level budget. And so I'm showing you not losing any of our programs, keeping all that we have. So that's, you know, with inflation, with the, the past history of those flat budgets um, at 0%, and then also dipping into our health reserve like we've been doing. So that's my analogy of what has happened here, unfortunately. I think appalling is the word that comes to mind. The history of past budgets increases is irrelevant because I don't I don't note anything in this proposed budget that's really sort of a catch up. The only thing that we're paying for, if you will, 
is having used the, the, the reserve as a, as a, as a, as a cushion. Um, but, you know, you could have spread that out over, over a millennium if you wanted to do that. Um, but there isn't anything in this budget where, we, in other words, we haven't deferred year after year after year, and then now we're going to have to pay the piper. This is a standalone as far as I'm concerned. And I know we should be patting ourselves on the back or have other people pat our, pat our backs saying, well, thank goodness you came in with zeros all these other years, so we'll forgive you for this one. This is a, this is a standalone increase uh, for the most part. Um, I, as I said, I don't have a question. I have an exclamation, but I'm going to reserve. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, well, we... We can debate the use of the reserve, though the town finance manager always said that we should not be holding money for multiple years that had accrued in previous years. Right. Um, that was not meant to be something that we held on to forever. Um, it was expected to be applied, you know, in, in the next yeah. in the next fiscal year. However, I don't recall ever seeing the the double whammy of the. Um, uh, health insurance going up this dramatically in one year, number one, and number two, obviously the transportation. I mean, these yeah. are the major drivers, um, you know, to, to where we we got to this budget. Um, and then, of course, we have the the request for um, bringing personnel out of um, our Besser into the operating budget, and also removing some. And you see there's a lot of tutors on there. Right. So I just want the board very much prepared that, you know, um, we have to handle this with great care. And even in removing other FTEs, we really have to remember our maximum number class size, too, in, when, in doing that. We can't then put our kids in classes of 30. It's just not responsible. No one's suggesting that. No, I'm not saying that you're suggesting it. I'm just saying that it's something we have to pay attention to. I have a question. Yeah. Um, did we get a benefit by consolidating the bus runs with high school and middle school? Or did the only entity that benefited is the bus company? I'm just... Did we see a reduction in costs, and are we? Well, we didn't see any cost savings doing that because we did it at the same time that we went out to bid for a new contract. Mm -hmm. And we selected a low, low bid, and it is what it is, which was a large increase from what we had previously. Okay. Also, we, I believe we pay for buses by the day. Mm -hmm. So whether we double up high school or separate high school and middle school, I think we, we wind up paying the same rate. I could be wrong, but... So let's just say that our contract was identical to the prior year's contract. We're still paying for the bus and the driver by the day. More same... Bus, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, Ian? Uh, the other uh, the meeting previous to this one, um, we were uh, looking for uh, some sort of um, capture on the amount of electricity used by the uh, by the dual operation of the eight, of, of the heating and the AC units at Northeast. Um, did that? Uh, Material that was not sent to you correctly, Mr. Kilpatrick? Oh, was that, did that come through yet? I had a report sent to me, but I need to meet with Dave to decipher exactly what it says before I'm able to okay. share it. Thank you. Um. I, I, you do have another sheet. I don't know, Lori. Do you have this one to put up? The one that has the um, 
the changes that were, they were actually, it was a page that we put in the frequently asked questions that was asked of us. What are the um, charges um, in the Board of Ed budget going forward for FY25? And then what are, from our ESSER funds, and then what are the things that will be reductions? So the top half are the ones that um, we've got in the budget. And as you see, um, they're related to um, teaching positions, the social work, a social worker, um, and a part-time social worker. Um, we have the math and English language arts tutors, the social emotional learning tutors um, that the principals were talking about as such an asset, um, the security guards. We have reduced security guards as well. So you see that there's, while there is some moving over, there is a reduction of some of these staff members. Um, the community coordinators, um, a slight reduction there. Um, we had added more hours for the community coordinators during the ARP ESSER time, during the COVID times, and we're gonna have to you know, pull back on that a little bit. Um, technology support of a 1.0, um, and then communications specialist 1.0 moving forward um, that was paid for in grants prior and then some uh, half-time part-time custodian, um, half of a part-time custodian. And then reductions we're looking at um, teaching personnel support at 6.5 in, in a reduction. We're looking at special ed tutors. They were actually hired when we couldn't hire paraprofessionals, so with the new contract and with the RBT put in there, we're really hopeful that with the, you know, the increases in the contract that we will be able to hire the tutors. So we're gonna have to do that very delicately. Hire the um, paraeducators. Did I, paraeducators, right. Um, because by law and through a student's IEP, there's a requirement involved in that kind of level of support and what that looks like. Um, and there's some additional tutors in there that will be reduced, um, security guards, uh, that part-time custodian um, reduced, and then um, some building subs. We still will have building subs in all the schools, we just won't have as many. So you see that there's a reduction of 65.5 staff members, and then we're looking to transfer 43.25 over to the operation budget. Um, I'll recognize Ian and then Jen. Oh, and I'm sorry. Um, one of the uh, questions that I submitted was asking for a breakdown of the administration uh, costs, central office, the, um, the salaries, uh, job descriptions, dates of hire. So we did put in the contractual obligations that the board has made in all of those areas and they are in the frequently asked questions. So they, okay, we did add that. Um, they're whatever question item. I don't have the frequently asked questions in front of me, but you'll be able to find it with the question. They were linked in there. Well, I, I did ask to um, see that document a week ago with email and I haven't seen the document no one sent me. So I put it in board notes for all board members, the frequently asked questions with the links. I can resend it to you. Now which board notes was that the 22 uh, February 2nd board notes? I believe that was. I can look back. Jen, and then Adrian. So if I'm remembering correctly from like prior meetings, we had mentioned that this is um, only part of the ARP ESSER because we've already um, taken into account some of the reductions. Is the other half of the ARP ESSER hirings part of that negative 65? That is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Except for the um, some teaching personnel, this is uh, related to scheduling. Yeah. 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 Okay. The, the rest of the list <laughs> right. relates to our professor. 
Okay, so ARP SR, this is the ads, and then some of the ARP SR reductions is part of the 65. That's right. Okay. Most of them are Most part of the of 65, are. yeah. And the part time custodian, right? Is that like two different custodians? Because, like, cause I guess it we get to zero. We kept I'm one part time sorry. in and one part time out. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that's how that works. Okay. Thank you. Adrian? Yeah, so the uh, the additional 12 teacher retirements, are those part of the 65 that we're losing? And, um, and or are they positions that we're not filling? What are, the, what are those? Yeah, we're looking at um, both retirement and attrition, and then also with the scheduling, how that lays out. So it really has to lay out as the kids are ready to pick their courses in the next few weeks, you know, we'll know more about what that's going to look like to be specific. But we, we always look for those that are attrition or maybe aren't coming back or, you know, and those departments that they're in and then how the schedule really works. So are we accounting for this in the budget for this? Um, this Dave, has that already been accounted for in the budget? The oh. 12? Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, the 12 has already been accounted for. Okay, I had um, Beverly and then Ian and then back to Jen. Sorry. Susan, can you uh, talk to me about the need to have a communication specialist? Well, I would say, you know, we had a subcommittee. Um, oh, probably back in 2014 when I first arrived that was really looking for communications and marketing. We first um, drafted a plan, a communication plan at that time, and then the board reignited that whole committee really with the need of having a communication specialist. Um, the communication specialist um, does everything from family engagement to supporting kind of good news and not so good news and um, really communication across the districts from the schools to the central office and back again um, involved in enrollment and lottery and family engagement here with the registration. So it's really become a multifaceted um, position that has been really an asset to the district. Um, you know, anytime you see good news in the newspaper um, or across the board, you really can count on, you know, having a communication coordinator to help support the superintendent and all the departments and the schools with that. So I, I think it was really the um, back in that day when we first hired that person through a grant and part time. Um, that was something that the district really wanted, the board wanted, and um, we saw some reignition of that and with the committee, you know, um, to have a department or to have a person, um, a one-person department that can do that work, I think has been really um, an advantage for the district. How much does that, that, that cost us, Susan? And is that something that the schools can do themselves? Like each school can contact the newspaper if they're having a special program? I would say that's not really very doable. Our schools have maybe one secretary and someone very part-time as a, communi as a um, community coordinator. They, uh, and you know, and a principal and an assistant principal. The bigger schools have maybe an additional person administrator and person in the office, but I would say that that's really not something that with all that's going on in the schools today that certainly they're communicating with their own school community and using our parent square, but to do things more than that, um, I mean this person is an asset to helping all of our schools and the central office with that communications. And what's the salary for that person? Um, I believe it's 78,000. I think. And that's with the benefits, probably. But that has become a full time job, full year round job. Mm, okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, next, I'll recognize Ian and then uh, Jen. 
So <laughs> when we first discussed the frequently asked questions spreadsheet, um, I expressed interest in, it's great to collect all these questions, but I think we should be able to review them and discuss the outcome of them on the record in a meeting. So I'm not sure when we can do that, or if we can maybe dive into that a little bit now. I'm trying to access the spreadsheet from the board notes. Uh, the link doesn't seem to be working. Um, so I don't know if that, again, it'd be great to have that just kind of like cut away from the board notes and have an explicit document sent that is easy access. I can do that for you. I'd be happy to do that for you. And, and please share with the whole board too. Well, and I've been that. sharing with the and whole board. That's why I put, I always share with the whole board and that's why board notes are so essential. So is that something that can happen soon? Which document exactly are you looking He's for? He's looking for the frequently asked question. The document. frequently asked questions? Yep. Yeah, the spreadsheet. We can do I that. See noted in the board notes, but there's no discussion of it. There's no elaboration. It's just a, it's a hot link. I just clicked the hot link and it's, it's not functioning. I'll work on that with my um, admin assistant tomorrow. So, um, in regards to the central office, you know, um, did, were, do you know that, do you know if the information that I asked for was collected and organized the way that I had asked for it? I, I don't know specifically what you, you mean by that. I mean, I think we've given you um, the function codes. We've given you the, the layout of what central office is. Um, I don't know beyond that what else you would need. I mean, this is typically what we do during a budget cycle. This is the information that the board reviews. So yeah, beyond I that, I don't know what additional I things you need. Mr. Piazza. I just got the link from Mr. Piazza. Thank you. I just sent my request for access back. Oh. That, I, that might have been um, transformed in the PDF. So I think I better look at that tomorrow with Joyce. Phil. This Joyce will get it. I Joyce will get it out tomorrow. This as a discussion item at some point in, in the very near future before, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I feel like I was very specific with what I asked, you know, is job descriptions and, um, you know. I just want to tell you that it's taken my staff a great deal of time to provide the answers to these questions. So you have to realize we're also going through a budget process. So there are things that are priorities and we tried to answer the questions the best we could, but there's a lot of staff time and energy and overtime that would have to go into some of the specificity you're asking for. Yeah. Well, this is a weird feedback loop. Thank you. Okay, Jen. Um, I apologize for not asking this earlier when I um, originally had the floor, but um, not all of these are created equally, but if you can append this document to have like the associated dollar values. And which one are you looking at? Um, oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. We can do that. Sorry, um, I just asked on the people um, charges for fiscal year 25, the budget change one, Matt, that um, not to just include the FTEs, but um, put the associated dollars too, because not all positions are created equally. So we may be going down um, a higher number, but the cost may not be uh, equivalent? I don't know, so that's why I'm asking for it. Um, my question, what, what's it? I'm sorry. Was there, I didn't see a hand raised. Oh, me. No. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, um, this is just going back to special ed. Um, I just see that there's a director and three supervisors. 
Has that been the case for a long time? That we've, I, I since always, I've I been here. I thought there was two supervisors. But. Well, since I've been here. I, one might have been added on when I got here, but that for a decade it's been. Yeah, yeah. a yeah. decade. And they have really specific purposes. So one of the supervisors, for instance, is handling really our preschool, pre-K, and elementary um, education. We have one that really is dealing with a lot of our specialized programs, and we have one that is dealing with more of the um, secondary and high school. And even Denise Doolittle, who is the director, does handle some of the specialized programs herself. And then we have all the children who are in the inter-district magnets that need supervision. So a supervisor has to go to a PPT of any child that's in an inter-district magnet. So even though they might be serviced by another school district, it's our responsibility to be able to pay and provide special education services. So we need to seat at the table. So there's that additional roles and responsibilities for each one too, for kids who are in the district and students who are in inter-district magnets or outplaced. So. So the inter-district inter magnets, those, those numbers have gone down a lot though, haven't they? They've gone years? down. They've gone down, but there's still quite a few um, cases. Even in Sacred Heart, if they're at Sacred Heart School, we have a responsibility to be there at the table. So w what I'd like to see <clears throat> is a discussion of um, basically why these positions are, are needed. Um, we're going to be going to the council and the RTM and we're going to need to justify, um, you know, why because this, this really isn't going to, to uh, translate to a level service budget. This is adding. Um, so, you know, if we can just get an explanation, you know, based on, on student need of why we need the ones we need. Um, I'm, the other thing I'm hearing tonight is um, concern about the shifting um, reimbursement from the state about the interdistrict uh, Magnet. So I, we have baked into the budget that there will be no more tuition. But what I'm hearing, is that correct, Dave? There, you left something in the budget, didn't you, just for the security's sake? But it wasn't what they're saying now. The sped reimbursements and magnet, uh, sped magnet tuition reimbursements, but not the, uh, not the inter-district magnet. But now they, they changed their tune on this one. Jay, I think you were on that call. We heard it again last week. With the legislators. Yeah, so in other words, this is this is going to be decided by the legislature. Uh, this was not a final decision from State Department of Ed. The, the legislators are actually going to be tinkering with this reimbursement during this session, which is going to be difficult because we're in the middle of mm -hmm. presenting a budget. We have to present something uh, by the 28th. Um, I'm just concerned about how how we're supposed to uh, to budget for that. Um, and you know, I I think the other thing I've heard tonight is we're going to have to have at least one more meeting. I think where everyone brings, you know, their questions. Where we can look at the the FAQs, and I think we need to be able to address the specific questions. And um, you know. In the past, um, the administration has given us some some options about. That's what we plan on doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, if we do this, the budget will be this. So we, you know, I'd like to see some scenarios right. that we can consider. Um, and I don't want to hear, you know, not that this would be you, but I, you know, I don't want to hear as some districts do about well, we're going to cut hockey football or something you know <laughs> right. we, we want this to be a you know a, a legitimate um, decision that we can make to help guide us uh, we are going to be doing a uh, meeting with the town council and RTM uh, next Monday and that's going to also be followed by a um, public hearing public hearing mm -hmm. um, and so we'll be getting some feedback on the budget before we have to make our decision Uh, I'll recognize Ian and then Jen. Um, I just got to say, say that, that 
this is overall been a bit of a frustrating process. Um, I feel like there's a lot of information that's not been presented, not been ready, not been in hand. Um, you know, people not getting reports, um, not being ready to discuss items, uh, not adhering to requests for very specific items. Uh, I'm not sure how we're supposed to operate when we can't have the information that we ask for or present the information in a way that, uh, you know, is kind of seemingly, seemingly haphazard. Uh, we started out with one presentation model and then that proved to be inefficient and confusing and now we should do another, another presentation model and which is all well and good. But you know, the agendas that we had, that we received, didn't actually identify or match what we had in our packets. <clears throat> you know, we have roughly about, uh, what, two weeks to pull this thing together? Um, I would like to think that we can you know, all get some clarity, of, you know, just let, let's get the homework done and come to the table with the items that are most likely to be asked for. I mean, it's not, we're not asking for things that are, that are completely off base here. Like we're just asking more for more specific details. You know, I've heard a number of people ask for things and a number of responses of like, I don't have it with me now, I'll get back to you. You know, and then that puts the onus on us to ask and, and follow up. And then we have this document that we have to go dig into for the frequently asked questions. And, you know, again, that's okay for us, but then the public at home who are, who are following along, there's a lot of people viewing every night. Um, you know, they're not able to follow those questions and we're not able to, we're not allowing for discussion for them on the, uh, of those questions on the record. Um, so, I think, I think we need to allow for that, that, and I hope we make time for that over the coming sessions that we have left before we meet with the RTM and the town council. Um, oh, that's what the public hearing is for. The, uh, now the 12th, right? We are meeting with the RTM and the town council on the 12th, is that correct? Yes, and there'll be a public hearing. Yeah. Sorry, so I meant the public hearing. So there is no time left for the town council and the RTM. We're going to sit there and I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, so, I mean, I, I thank everyone for the efforts that they did do, and, and you know, I, I, I can understand hiccups in technology, and I, I can understand a lot, but, you know, just, it feels, you know, that, that this whole this whole process, I've seen a number of cycles, a number of times, and, and it seems to be, you know, this is a lot more disorganized this year, so I'm, I'm just a little frustrated, and confused so uh, thank you and I'll take a look at that document and see what I can decipher out of that all right thank you and, and, see you and all night, Jen and then Andrea okay just um, I know you said you're gonna present one of the options oh I know you said you're gonna present one of the options can one of the options and I know this is totally thinking out of the box um, and I don't know if we're required to do this, but how much savings would we get if we stop like the magnet programs? The inter-district magnet programs, did that add additional costs to our district budget? No, it actually balances enrollment for us. It does a really good job of balancing so that we have seats for every kid at any time of the year. Um, in the past, you know, you would see class sizes of 25, 28 in some of our military schools. We don't have that anymore. So it's really a more efficient way to do business now. Okay. I'm wondering if it would be to our advantage to have any concerns sent to Susan before the meeting so that she and, and her staff, so that she can anticipate right. uh, answers for us. That would be helpful. Yeah. And in terms of the magnet schools, I think that's keeping us out of jail. 
<laughs> well, yes. it was it was really, um, you know, through the State Department, our schools were not balanced mm -hmm. in this. I mean, we had a West Side and we had a Cutler, you know, two middle schools, but now that we have one, they're perfectly mm -hmm. balanced. And um, same thing is true for our school districts across that that is, um, they've been really more economically balanced than anything. Not perfectly, but very close to what the district is. So we've done a much better job with that. And the other thing I'd like to say is, I mean, um, I know there are other districts that, that have one or two meetings on the budget. Um, I just would like to say that, you know, I appreciate the time and the effort that each individual member um, has taken in, in formulating the questions. And we do have, you know, the frequent, we, we haven't done that before, the frequently asked questions, sort of the, um, uh, the answers to those questions. So it's been a very, um, it has been a different cycle. We have discussed, I think, a lot deeper than even previous boards in Groton have, to be honest. And uh, we do have more time, and I'm certainly willing uh, to meet again um, if we want to add additional meetings to make sure that everybody's you know, questions are answered. And um, so once everybody's had a, a chance to review you know, what's in the FAQs, um, and once we get the feedback, uh, from the town council rtm and, and the public at the hearing um, i think we're at a position to to have another meeting to review all of that and i would say one of our priorities in this budget was to help new members go through the process and to understand more fully our schools what our schools are involved with hear from the principals of the schools and the administration um, and also to see central office and special ed in its entirety. And I know that it's like putting together a puzzle. But in the end, you know, also understanding function codes and how they work. So it was really our goal was to help orient the board to all the many factors that drive a school budget. In addition to some of the anomalies we've had this year. This is a very different budget than I've ever seen. And I've been teaching for 43 years. So it's a very different thing than I've seen in the past. So it is, um, you know, it is a concern. And really even getting the numbers, we weren't going to guess on those numbers. We really thought it was a priority to meet with our insurance company to really get a handle on what that accuracy would be. I didn't want to just put any old number in there um, and just hope it worked. I really wanted to be strategic in doing so. So um, I'm sorry it felt a little haphazard, but just give grace to yourself. This is kind of a, a new process for some of you, and it's also we wanted to make it more meaningful. And I agree with you that there have been very thoughtful questions asked. So I'll recognize uh, Ian and then Beverly. Uh, thank, well, thank you. Um, um, just, just a, a quick, quick note, note on, on the magnet school, school question. question. Um, yes, yes, it is a legal a requirement that the, rea the, the magnet school, school decision was a, was a reaction to the legal mandate to better diversify the schools on a socioeconomic basis. Um, what is not being discussed is, is, is that it wouldn't need to be done if their socioeconomic dispersal was more even throughout the town. Mm. That's, so in some ways, the way the housing and uh, the demographics of the town have, are segregated, um, and certain demographics are in certain areas, and that's it. Um, that's what the Board of Ed is bearing the weight of that situation. By having the magnet program you're busing and the shipping around of all the students. Um, that's beyond our purview as a board, but I think it's also to keep in mind that's important for us to keep in mind as a community mm -hmm. that um, there are other solutions available that could create a more equitable dispersal of socioeconomic status and demographics around town so that maybe the magnet program would not have to exist if there's a more equitable dispersion of, of, of the demographics. Um, so, uh, 
in regards to the budget process, uh, I would be in favor of uh, another couple of meetings just to kind of try to put a bow on things, especially after uh, Monday's, Monday's meeting. Um, I think that's going to be a very important meeting to get feedback from the other bodies that will be approving the budget. And also, um, uh, the public hearing is win again. Uh, everything's happening Monday on the 12th. So we have the liaison meeting with the, you know, part of the RTM town council and then board. Um, part of the, I guess, the educational RTM group usually shows for that. And then afterwards is the public hearing. All right. And, and that's when public really can come and talk to us. Date, time, location is? It's at Thrive. Um, oh, no, it's at, um, yeah, Thrive 55 at the Senior Center. And um, I believe it's six, six o'clock it starts. Seven. And seven. Six and seven. Six and then seven? Right. Six and then seven. Six for the hearing meeting, seven for the public hearing. That's right. And just one quick note. I mean, I, I've been on the RTM a number of years and, and observed the budget process here. And, and, you know, as far as like the, the, the dynamic I mentioned before, the um, I'll get back to you on that, um, or I'll get that to you. That phrase I've heard a lot over the years. I'm just going to say that I've heard it a lot. Um, you know, I, I commend um, the finance director for uh, looking into the, the, the software, the module stuff, because I think in a lot of ways that would help. You know, if we had an expandable budget where we could do the drop down, that would that would just we could immediately answer a lot of these questions as far as the more detail of like, okay, so within this line item, you know, what positions exist and at what salary rates, you know, and, and you know which dues belong to which organization that. So I'll just leave it at that. Well, that is a priority. You heard me say that. So we really are going to look and scrutinize that software budget to see what we can do to get that to happen. I, can I just also add, I know Beverly's hands up too, but I wanted to add too, Ian, that when we decided to do the magnet schools, it wasn't just one of anything. There was really, um, the superintendent before me, Dr. Grenier, was really not interested in having kids redistricted like several superintendents before him and causing real upset in the community. And he also, we did a survey at the time, and our families were leaving Groton to go to these other magnet schools. They wanted to have choice. And so by providing our own intradistrict magnets, we were able to capture and bring back many of our children at the tune of about two and a half million dollars a year or more was typically what we were spending. And we reduced that by over a million dollars by bringing our own kids back because they had choice within Groton. So just wanted to give you a little bit of that history that there were not just one factor, there were multiple factors. But equity was a big piece of it. And, um, you know, and, and they really are thriving and families are very happy to have the choice. And to also have, they wanted choice, but they also wanted their district at home school too. So that's what we gave them. Um, I'm going to recognize uh, Beverly and then Andrea and then Matthew. Uh, Susan, I thought um, the reason why um, we have the interdistrict mandate schools now is it was not so much social economic, but I remember it being more racially imbalanced. And that's why all the prior superintendents try to be district to get you written a racially imbalanced school. It was it was a two prong social economics. It's both. So our community is now fifty four percent free and reduced lunch and fifty four percent students of color, so it almost is um, a two prong situation. So it's both. I'd like to thank you all for the presentation and the budget and you know all the information you gave us um next year though for me personally i could do away with the principal part and just <laughs> delve dive right into the budget and that listen so much to what each school is doing maybe we can do that at another time that's true we can do that at a different time yep 
I think that was done, Beverly, because this was a new process for so many people, and we really felt like they needed to have a depth of understanding of our schools and central office and how all things work, because it is confusing. It's quite dynamic. Andrea. I know you're going to yell at me because this isn't really budget. No. Oh, but, but, <laughs> but it has to do with the human aspect of why we all are here. And I, don't, don't you dare add or subtract when I say that in 1959, when Fitch Middle's students who all went, uh, came from uh, the, the Pequannock Bridge development. They were, uh, if you lived on this side of the street, you went to Fitch. If you went on that side of the street, you went to Cutler. There was no more sorrowful time in the history of our district than that decision. So I would urge you not to think of that. Okay, thank you. Matthew. Thank you. Uh, I hope that it will be possible for the whatever version we are on now of our budget to be complete, paginated, and sent to all the RTM and all the town councilors prior to our joint meeting. Thank you. Is it time? Dean. My understanding is this, this remains and will be on Monday the superintendent's right. budget since we have not touched it yet. Right. We're That's just, right. We're just listening. So. That's correct. That's right. They're welcome to have a copy of the superintendent's budget. It's not your budget yet, but it will be. We've got more work to do. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, is it not. <laughs> Before I uh, move to adjourn, I just want to remind, again, not on the budget, I want to remind everybody of Fitch Sr.'s celebration of black history this coming Friday night at 630. And some of our um, Martin Luther King scholars from the past will be there to, oh, to nice. participate. It's a district-wide musical presentation. Yes. So. I think I've sent it out a couple of times, but I'll send out another yeah, reminder. No, you, you've got to hear it sometimes. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Oh, wait. Could, could I just make one quick statement? Um, I do want to say that the, um, the budget process, there were there was definitely parts that were frustrating, um, you know, to Ian's point. But I did appreciate hearing from all the principals and all of the work that everybody did in making presentations. I, um, you know, being my first year, I learned a ton, and I, I don't want you to leave this meeting thinking that, that, you know, speaking for myself, and I'm sure everyone learned a lot in that pro process. Um, maybe there's different ways of doing it, right. you know, and people would have different ideas, but I, um, I do appreciate, you know, you. having that opportunity, and it was valuable for me. Well said. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you hear my motion? Okay. I wasn't saying, Adrian, that it wasn't valuable. I was just saying maybe we could have done that at a different time, and that when we were doing the budget. That's all I was saying. I, I appreciate listening to them. I love listening to the principals and what they're doing in their schools. But I, I think we should have went right into the budget, and maybe we could have did that prior to the budget starting. Maybe in, in December, when you first came on the board, we could have done that. And that's all I'm saying. Okay. All right, so we have a motion on the floor to adjourn. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you. Adrian seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone.